very simple. It's like every colonial situation. There is an occupier and there is an occupied. One, two, three, four! Occupation no more! Well Occupation no more! Occupation, Occupation no more! Five, six, seven, eight! Five, six, seven, eight! Israelan fascist! Israelan fascist! You know, it's not easy at all, you know, just like to go through, through this, this choice because, you know, as you see, every day we we are under this oppression by the army or by the settlers. You have breakfast in the morning, we have every week a problem with settlers. There is that road and the water and by water and uh, cable, electric cable, energy, everything, use our land to do that, to contact like Susia settlement, old Susia. Uh, sorry, military army. But we are not allowed to use that energy or water. Occupation is very, very comfortable. It doesn't bother them a bit. You don't feel it. Yeah. You don't feel it. Either you are ideal, you support it ideology, ideologically, or you that, that just don't give a damn. Does it bother? Who cares about it? This is a silent uh, genocide against the Palestinians in the area. The area is 60 percent of the West Bank, and there are just 50,000 Palestinians and around 300,000 citizens. The process we see in this area, and it is now clear, and everybody knows it and recognizes it. It wasn't easy to show. Is a slow process of driving Palestinians away from area C into areas B and A. What does it mean in the occupation? It means one state or two states, we leave it for the people. But at least we can go together till a point, till a certain point that people will be together. We are not against the Israelis as Israeli or as a Jewish. We are against the occupation, the Zionism, and uh, uh, for this we are welcoming them to be part in our action. Also, we could that the uh, international uh, from all of the world to be part for this all of our action from the, the first moment till now we have uh, Israeli international and Palestinian together. I trust the Palestinians. I mean, they, they are strong, and they are stubborn, and in spite of all these things, they have been uh, staying for. In, in similar conditions over many, many years, and I hope they'll be able to do it uh, for more years. And our experience is that little by little, it is the army that becomes less strict, because the Palestinians are coming back. This is the occupation, this is the mind occupation. Why you didn't respect your humanity and refuse the orders and refuse to do this? You can be with us the same as the Israelis who are with us. Look how you are sweating now because of the sun. Why? You are not forced to, be, to do this. You can be in your home in the shadow of being in the sun. Look, you are sweating. And why? Why you are all of this? Why? Because you are looking my village. They tell you that this is a Palestinian village. Understand, you use, my, use your mind. You are in jail. You can go to the beach. I am sure you cannot go. You are able to meet your boyfriend. No, you are not allowed. Because you are in the army. Put the glass on your eyes. What is popular resistance in, in Pakistan? And where we are now in 2015, if there is like any popular resistance, is it visible? Is there any achievements? As we know all, in, in the beginning of the 90s, that there was an initiative to solve the conflicts in, in the Middle East, in Palestine and Israel. And that was comes as a result of the Madrid conference, and then we have also a court. And it was, this initiative was to build a Palestinian state, Theory, but on the ground, what we found is something on contrary is happening from increasing settlements, and we end by the second intifada. And then we can say that also accord is failed. If we look at the 
passed. So the first intifada, in a way, was successful. It raised the whole issue and started the processes. <coughs> the second one was a catastrophe. <laughs> so, uh, but but uh, Palestinian reaction to the occupation is a factor, this way or the other. In the spirit of time, we see that we must start in the popular resistance and popular struggle. Because we, we will uh, uh, study the, our history, we see that we become mere of our goal when we use this mean. Our society is out of the second intifada. Yeah. Uh, and he is hardly face a lot of violence. Yeah. And it's not easy for the population to go directly from this way to that way. We're thinking about how we can uh, enlarge or move our action to be in all of Palestine. For this, in 2011 and uh, 12, we try to work together uh, in many actions, as I told, as a popular committees from all of this village. Even it was exist before during the history of uh, occupation, since even the British mandate and later on. But in, nowadays, it is more visible and more adopting a strategy of popular resistance, which, in, in, if I really want to define it in the Palestinian definition, is al muqawma shabiya which means that everyone can participate in it and without dropping any other rights of resistance. And it's not the methodology of, like, if I adopt this, means I must criticize the other, means I will deny the other, means... And this is one of the reasons why people in the popular resistance, they do not care. They care about what they believe in, in going on, in their daily struggle in the villages where the wall is passing on, where the settlements are built on their land, where there is really a daily confrontation with the settlers, with the, with the, with the army. We feel that what we are doing is uh, to indicate about this mean, in this period of time, that it will be uh, more suitable for our issue. I think it's much more, it's much scarier for them and much more complicated for the Israeli army and the authorities and the police to confront these kind of demonstrations because they are standing in front of kids and they are standing in front of people that that shoot uh, that shoot uh, uh, rocks at them or Molotov cocktails in the worst uh, scenario that not even that happened. I mean, it's also an issue of people calling it non-violent. For me, I call it non-armed because it's violence. I mean, people throwing stones is violence, you know. You can say it's good or it's, you can say it's bad, but it's violence, you know. People throwing stones or people who are doing whatever, it's violence, you know. There is violence in the moment. It's a violent situation. For me, the big success is that it's not non-armed. I mean, I, I think it's legitimate, like, I think it's legitimate for somebody to throw stones at a car when they come to his house and they knock at his door at 5 o'clock in the morning. I think it's legitimate, you know. I see that we are in a junction now. And this junction is after the ferry of Oslo and the negotiations is that the Palestinians want to go to this transformation towards popular resistance. From my observations, from my participation, I see that now it is the beginning of the uh, to turn the wheels of the popular resistance towards massive participation of Palestinians because of this end road of negotiations and what so-called peace process within the to last 20 years of wasting time with negotiations and uh, peace process. That the people it trust the, the action, trust what will happen. And this is something important uh, uh, and a pulse for the popular resistance in the Palestinian society. Within popular resistance, you, you discover people, you discover that there are many, many people who have skills and they are able to organize, they are able to uh, lead actions in a, in a way that you do not expect it before. And especially with the women in Bab Shams to see a rule, even there are few, few women, but they are able to lead, they are able to give opinions, they are able to lead the media campaigns and to, to organize all of these things is something that those people believe in.
and they manage to put the seeds of resistance, of popular resistance, in the future within the children who are growing up in a practical non-violent school, in a practical resistance, or real resistance, to see the children growing up day by day in the demonstrations, in, confront uh, in confrontations. This is something that we give value to in order to see in the future a generation who believe in uh, organizing resistance against occupation instead of uh, putting them in a different environment far away from the reality, far away from what's going on. היא בן אדם, ארוש כמוך, זה ספונטני וזו תגובה שהיא טובה, היא טובה לכולנו. כי זה כן בני אדם. הכיבוש זה מדיניות, אבל בני אדם לא יכולים לשאת את המדיניות הזאת. הכיבוש זה מדיניות. זה לא באמת אתה וזה לא באמת היא. הכיבוש זה מדיניות ואף בן אדם לא יכול לשאת אותה. לא הפלסטינים ולא הישראלים. אי אפשר לשאת מדיניות שאין לה שום קשר למציאות. וזה מה שקורה פה עכשיו. יש פה תחושה שמשהו ממש ממש לא בסדר, משום שיש מדיניות שאין לה שום קשר למציאות. וזאת מדיניות הכיבוש. את מרגישה את זה, ארוס מרגיש את זה. אני פה רק דובר את המצב הזה, אני לא בא לעשות נזק. אני דובר עבורכם משהו שהוא כאילו מוחש אצלכם. זה הדבר היחיד שקורה פה. We will never be trained the same as donkeys. So why to use our muscles? Let's use our brains. Let's replace our guns by pens. It's better. It's better. Do not live okay. in the Middle Ages. So now it's the time for you to think by your minds how we are going to respect our humanity. And instead of putting a gun between me and you, let's have a, a bottle of water between us. Why? Why to carry the gun? Why? Why you need the gun? Tell me. I will never allow my daughter to carry a gun. Going to the army, therefore, is like the most basic duty that you have as a citizen. Um, and it was believed, and not just believed, it was common practice, that if you didn't go to the army, you would be frowned upon, and it would be harder to get a job, because you'd be asked to provide why you would to go to the army, and so on. When I was in elementary school, we had a soldier who was like, teaching little kids. That was her job. She was coming to school in the morning. She was teaching what people, the kids, were the problem with school, stuff like that. So you get like this kind of organization with like the uniforms and the guns and stuff like, all over there. And you kind of brainwashed from a very, very young age. Schools kind of adopt uh, combat units and you know, send them gifts and stuff like that. Um, and, but it's also other things. I mean, like, it's. it's the way that they teach you history yeah. of, of our wars and, and so on, you know, we've been attached time after time after time. Uh, the fact that you don't know, like nobody here knows what the green line is. If you see um, like a map, Israeli map, on the wall of any classroom, then, you know, it doesn't have the green line on it, even though Israel knows that that's the official border and the audit is something by Turkish, but it doesn't appear on a map in any school. So you just know that that's the country that you're supposed to protect. Society is so militarized uh, and gives such priority to people that went to combat units and so on. But that means that mostly men from elite classes that went to elite units uh, get to move on and become, you know, elite politicians and elite finance men. And you know, um, if you look at the the upper levels of the academia and the politics and uh, big companies, you know, it's mostly men that came out from elite units and, you know, are pushing each other forward. The first of these were in the early 70s and it was a group of young high school students um, called Shemistim and Shemistim is uh, high school seniors. Uh, and it was a very small group, and they said it was right after the, the Six Day War, and they said that the occupation of the territories and the Sinai Desert um, was a step that has to be undone through the peace process, and they, they told uh, in the letter to the Prime Minister um, that the act, the, the act of sending a petition, a statement, the Prime Minister, then Golda Meir, saying, um, if you do not give back the territories occupied in the war, there will be another war, and the blood of, of our generation will be on your hands, and therefore we refuse to take part in, in the war effort. 
And others say, we said that they would join the army but not to serve in their territories, and others, like myself, said that we would uh, refuse service altogether openly and declare it as conscientious objection um, because of their creation. It's a big dilemma for people that are um, fighting for freedom of conscience and against militarism. It's a question, of, do you want to, to abolish the draft? Uh, do you want to fight against Manchester service? Uh, because you know that in a capitalist system, that would mean that only the, the poorest and the weakest people in society would go. And some people would say that you have to campaign to end the draft because of this. And, and some say, no, we, we have to fight against the patient, but, but we should live with the fact that uh, everybody goes to the army, because otherwise uh, it, it's going to just fuck up the poor. ואפילו לא במקום כל כך עמוק בפנים שהוא לא אמור להיות פה. והמדיניות של הכיבוש זה מדיניות שאין לה שום קשר למציאות. ולכן מה שקורה פה מרגיש לכל אחד ואחד מהם ומאיתנו שהוא לא אמור לקרות. הם לא יכולים להיות פה. הם קורבנות של הכיבוש לא פחות מאיתנו. הם סובלים עכשיו. הם לא יכולים לעמוד The popular struggle was a testing ground for weapons. They try every kind of weapons you can imagine. They have six different types of gas, canisters, like way of gas that come from the different range that they want. So they have a round one that looks like apple. They have long ones, they have ones that uh, go for 500 meters and they use, they use them as uh, weapons. And they shoot it inside the houses of the people or they have uh, something called a scream, which is basically they take the car of the, the vehicle of the army and they put speakers like, like a sound system of a party, you know, and they, spay, and they play really specific note, like tone, you know, like it's like it's really, really high. And uh, you can you, you you become crazy, you know. Like you, 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 I mean, people like can faint from it. Ninety-five percent of the demonstration that I went in the West Bank were violent. It, it's it's very rare that there will not be a, like a, a violent demonstration with gas or I mean, it, it difference between there is difference between like the different villages. I mean, some villages are bigger and they get support from other villages, like in Nabi Salah or in Yalin or Bilin, when there are a lot of people, so there is more violence. Uh, in Masra, for example, there is less people, and the, like the, the, the place where it's built, it, the, I mean, there is, there is less chance for, for, like, for confrontation. A lot of people got killed. Um, 22 people got killed in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this struggle since, uh, since 2003. The third way that they have in order to confront a demonstration is arrests. Arrest, arresting a lot of people, uh, really a lot of people. When I talk to Israelis about the occupation, I tell them, listen, the situation is very simple. Okay, when people want to argue with me, it's like every colonial situation. There is an occupier and there is an occupier. This is the basis of the situation, you know. It doesn't matter what happened in the past or why it happened. The situation right now is that you are an Israeli, you are an occupier. It doesn't matter if you are a soldier or not. Okay, for me, I'm in the position of an occupier. There's nothing I can do about it.
we feel that the wall and the checkpoint, the settlement is not the problem, it's the face of the problem. For that, when we target the wall in Bil'in, or the, the, the rotate of the wall, it's not, uh, we don't feel that we end the problem when they change the direction of the wall. It's a partial succeed. But that in general, we must continue our struggle. We believe that it's not our duty and also your duty. Because the Palestinian issue and our suffering has come after the international community solved the Holocaust problem from our account. And we become the victim of the victim. For that, it's your responsibility and your duty. And it's your opportunity to take your role and duty to do something, to solve what you uh, participate in 